everyone. Welcome to Ishi's South Asia Union Summit led by women. You're watching session 10 on day two of the summit. This panel is titled Pathbreaking Education, Raising Global Citizens of a Digital World. Our panelists will be talking about why the old ways of education are not enough to equip South Asian youth for a digital future and what kinds of new approaches are needed in education. I'm honored to introduce our panelists to you all today. First up, we have Monica Malhotra Kandhari, one of the most powerful women in Indian business. Monica heads one of India's biggest publishing houses. Hi, Monica, nice to have you here. Nice, nice to meet you all. Thank you, thank you for having me. Monica's group is called the MBT Group, which has interests in educational tools and technology luxury retail, five-star hotels, and real estate. She constantly pushes the company towards innovation in education, whether it's the use of virtual reality in their educational apps, 3D printing, robotics, or assessment and teacher training portals. MBD has partnered with the Indian government as the official printer in 15 states and has a nationwide presence in South Africa and Sri Lanka. Monica is joining us from Dubai today, though she's based in Delhi, and I'm so honored to have you with us. I look forward to hearing your thoughts. Thank you. Next, we have Shanila Said. Hi, Shanila. Nice to have you. Hi. <laughs> She's the author of the book, How to Raise a Tech Genius, which I absolutely loved and I highly recommend it for parents of young children. Shanila is the director of the Digital Schoolhouse Program developed by UK Interactive Entertainment Association. Over the past six years, her work has focused on adding computational thinking the basic reading, writing, and arith arithmetic for younger children. She has taken her dream of inspiring and engaging educators and learners to over 100,000 children and 10,000 teachers since 2014. Shanila is joining us from London, and I send you a very warm and humid welcome from Delhi today. <laughs> Thank you very much. Nice to be here. All right. And our, our third panelist for the day is Feza Yusuf. Hi, Feza. She's joining us from Karachi. Feza is a multi-award winning community leader, change maker, and founder of Women in Tech PK, the biggest tech community for women technologists in Pakistan. A postgraduate from NED University of Engineering and Technology in Karachi, Feza currently leads the product development wing for a software development company. A community funded coding and business skills bootcamp, Code Girls, teaches coding skills to girls and women in Karachi, who have never had the opportunity to get technical education and proper mentoring. Welcome, Faiza. I look forward to hearing your experience and views today. And finally, I'd like to introduce our moderator, Shanila Said. She's the author, sorry, <laughs> our moderator, Sabine Muzaffar, a feminist publisher and editor based in Dubai. Her digital media and development platform, Ananke, has been documenting female trailblazers and empowering women and girls across South Asia and the Middle East through awareness, advocacy, and education. Thank you, Sabine, for moderating this panel. And I, I hand over to your very able hands to take the discussion forward. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, welcome, everyone. I am absolutely thrilled to be hosting this uh, esteemed panel. Uh, just a few thoughts uh, that I uh, wanted to share first. So education of more than 434 million children in South Asia has been interrupted by COVID-19. The dismal state of affairs extend to students learning significantly less compared to pre-pandemic levels. According to UNICEF's Regional Director for South Asia, George Larrier Adeji, school closures in South Asia have forced hundreds of millions of children and their teachers to transition to remote learning in a region with low connectivity and device, device affordability. Even when a family has access to technology, children are not always able to access it. As a result, children have suffered enormous setbacks in their learning journeys. A U.S. news agency reported that in India, 80% of children aged 14 to 18 reported lower levels of learning than when physically at school. So we live in a world with buzzwords like future of work, digital transformation, modern workplace. And in such a world, I think it is tantamount to a crime 
if a child lacks access to education, to technology, and innovation. There is no, or rather, should be no future of work if you're unable to first give access to education, then bring to evolve for a digital evolutionary future. And with this, I turn to Pfizer Yusuf. Pfizer, I have a two-pronged question for you. You founded Pakistan's leading women in tech community and are also the co-founder of a highly successful and change-making entity, Code Girls Pakistan. Can you tell us a bit about these platforms? And moving to my second question, leaders in tech as well as freshers, etc., and also envisioning impact on the ground through capacity building, you think there's a correlation between the two that is equipping women and girls with the necessary tech tools and also building a community where they can be role models, they can network and they can engage? Yeah, definitely. Um, Sabine, the reason that we started Code Girls was basically to make sure that uh, women get the opportunity that they don't. So families usually do not invest in technical education for girls. And this is the problem that we were trying to solve to give them access to uh, a training program that is free, free of cost for them so that they can kind of dip their toes and see if they like to uh, you know, code, if they want to work in technology industry. And the reason that I founded the community was I, I founded the community first and then uh, got into Code Girls. Uh, the idea for the community was to basically show role models to aspiring women in tech and young women in tech. I was teaching at a university at that time as a visiting professor. And um, a lot of, you know, girl students would come to me and say that we hardly know any women in women who are working in tech other than Jahara and you as our teacher. So that was a very, very sad state of affair in the sense that I, I know hundreds and thousands of women who are working in tech industry and why, why there is no visibility. So I started that community to kind of bring visibility to this idea that uh, women are working in tech and aspiring women should look up to them and kind of connect with them, find opportunities for work and learning. And Code Girls is basically solving um, kind of the problem with access. Um, so again, uh, the, the demographic that we target, a lot of them do not have access to uh, devices at home. A lot of them do not have access to internet at home. And then we also try to solve these problems by providing them with access, providing them with infrastructure, whatever is required. Wow, I think that you've been, you know, I've been following your journey and it is, uh, you know, amazing what Code Girls has achieved. Uh, and with this, I turn to Monica. You head one of India's most reputed publishing houses with interest in educational tools and technology, apart from luxury retail, five-star hotels, real estate, real estate. So can you tell me a bit more about your enterprise focusing education and why, in your opinion, is it important to digitize the education sector? Uh, well, that's a very relevant question, uh, especially when we see today that teaching and learning processes have evolved a lot. It is no more about, uh, you know, that where we are, uh, the teachers are more uh, bothered about just finishing up the syllabuses or uh, the children, how many, uh, how much marks they are getting. It is about the learning outcomes when we are talking about the 21st century skills. We have to prepare our children for to be global citizens. We, it is about today. Today, it is about individual learning curves. It is about standardized learning processes and the outcomes which we are wanting so that our children uh, are in sync with, with uh, becoming global citizens and having the 21st century century skills. It's, it becomes of utmost importance to us that we, they are, th these children are exposed to technology because when they're going to go to work later, technology is one, one will be one of the strongest medium in whichever sphere they work. So uh, this is one thing. Secondly, uh, I think because the student ra teacher ratio is, uh, is not apt in, uh, in our countries, uh, more so the teachers do uh, map the learning gap or learning curve for each child is very, very difficult. So um, we, uh, the technology comes to rescue. 
whereby uh, the, the the tests are uh, devised in such a way with, uh, which which evolves artificial intelligence in it so that you can map the learning curve and the gap of each child and it the technology also helps in customizing the content for that particular child which in a class when we are doing traditional learning or teaching it may not be possible with with a class of 40 to 50 children in one class to a teacher so uh, plus we are also talking about flexibility where the child can read or uh, or understand a concept at uh, his or her own pace and there has, has to be flexibility of timings some children uh, understand a concept in uh, faster some un understand it slower so the technology again comes in for rescue you have a lot of video lectures a lot of teachers around the world who are renowned teachers who have their lectures uh, online and they they also teach online and in case a child is in an area where there's uh, where there's a lack of there's lack of good teacher for a particular subject so they can avail of the knowledge from the internet and plus they 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 can be abreast with not only the, uh, the 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 core subjects they can be abreast with the skills in terms of very important now with the new education policy in india a lot of emphasis has come on the skills how many schools will have skilled teachers at uh, in the, uh, at school level so again technology comes to the rescue that we have courseware online for the students where they can avail of this knowledge and be future ready citizens so that's one thing another thing is cost saving Today, with the help of advent of internet, we have courses from Harvard, MIT, and at a much lesser price than to be on campus. There are so many people who are already into service and they cannot do their studies and go abroad or, or probably go into a good institution and devote that time and money also. So that it again comes to, to rescue. Today, we have to talk about the one thing which myth I want to clear here, that it is not traditional versus technology. It's technology is another tool to be used along with traditional teaching and learning. So it 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 has to be plugged in when it has to be plugged in, not to be overdone. Uh, that has to be uh, that, that caution has to be there. So blending learning, according to me, is the future. Books and technology has to be read read together, consumed together. So that that is what I see as future. If children has to be, they have to be future ready. And at MBD, we have. We are into virtual reality. We were the first ones to bring augmented reality into our books, robotics. We also uh, have recently launched our um, uh, app called Ahsoka. It, ha it caters to all the children who are studying and it has everything and anything which a school wants or a child wants, right from eBooks to video lectures, to online sessions, to assessments, to self-assessment, to even tests. Uh, it, the, in terms of it's like a friend to the particular student that what you are lacking in and what extra material has to be given to you so that you come at par to what is what is expected out of you. So at MBD, we have been the pioneers, whether it in terms of books or whether in terms of uh, e-learning or m-learning, we were the first ones to bring that technology to cater segment, especially in India. And we are also working in South Africa and Sri Lanka we Sri Lanka, we are we have proposed many solutions to the government, and in South Africa, we have given our solutions to a lot of uh, provinces whereby children are reading our uh, uh, e-learning resources. So, uh, by far, if I see that if we talk about rural India or uh, we're talking about the cities, so if rural India government is doing a lot of um, uh, infrastructure uh, advancements so that we, they get internet, they get devices. So. That bit has to be covered, as as the previous speakers were also saying. That bit has to be covered. That bridge has to be made because right now only in this pandemic, only thirty percent of of the students could read or could avail of this online uh, medium of education. So that is must for us. We need to do two point like two point six lakh crores or something. Government is spending in India to join the kids uh, and and connect the kids in terms of internet connectivity and th uh, connectivity. And uh, we think be ready for any kind of epidemic or pandemic in future also god forbid if it happens we should not arrive to this gap which we have arrived today in normal times also the gaps are there but this has this pandemic has increased those gaps of uh, learning as uh, uh, and sabine and uh, faza was was talking about so let's uh, i think it's important for us today to to uh, 
go head towards the technology technology so much monica I, and i absolutely yeah sorry yeah. and done yeah I, i absolutely yeah i absolutely agree with you monica you know blended or hybrid way of learning is the way to go uh, coupled with you know uh, technologies like augmented reality and uh, virtual reality i think uh, innovation would excite you know our children because it's something new and they're into gaming and you know you can learn so yeah. much through gaming as well so um, now i turn to shahnila uh, and i'm absolutely fascinated by your work at the digital school house can you tell can tell us more about uh, about it and why education needs to be innovative especially in terms of the system that you've developed thank you sabine um you know i i started teaching a long time ago and since uh day one i've always been interested in finding um the most fun and inspiring ways to teach to teach my subject which was computing so i've been doing that for for over 20 years and before uh when you know when uh, teachers were still i felt like we were ambassadors for microsoft office um and well, that's the only thing we were teaching and you know it left much to be desired but it was about you know how can we do this differently and how can we rethink this and and that led to sort of lots of practitioner research uh, which has ultimately fed into what digital schoolhouse is today so digital schoolhouse is a pioneering program that uses play based learning to teach creative computing uh we have a network of 52 schoolhouses across the uk um and the program delivers free workshops on a weekly basis to other teachers and school children from other schools within the local community so uh to put that in other words uh from the point of view of a child they are going on a school trip during the school day it just happens to be to one of our schoolhouses and uh where they learn computing in a way that we hope is i would say completely crazy and off the wall and wacky but loads of fun um and the teachers learn alongside the children and in the uk that's been a big thing because there's been lots of discussions within the educational climate around uh, for a number of years now around teacher workloads and teacher workload agreements um one of the ways head teachers have traditionally tried to lower teachers workloads is to reduce the amount of time they spend covering other teachers lessons when they are absent so uh, those are in the education world known as cover lessons over here in the UK um the knock on effect of that is that if a teacher wants to take a day out for training they're typically not allowed or they're capped at you're allowed one day across the whole academic year now if you're allowed one day across the whole academic year and there's such a vast array of opportunities to choose from like you're really like, so you know there's this there's this is an advent of increasing number of teachers that are taking courses and tra doing training in evenings and weekends and holidays in their own personal time um i find that awful to be honest i i i can understand the passion teachers are very passionate and dedicated people which is why they do it and it is about your personal upskilling and growth so it's fine to that level but it is one of the few sectors professional sectors where in order to upskill yourself and to improve your knowledge you have to do that in your own time like that's that's insane right you you've got to you've got to change there's no comeback for it they don't teachers don't you know the school won't give you any money or time to compensate you know you losing all your weekends for a month or something like that they won't they won't do that so digital schoolhouse um because it's a school trip the teacher learns alongside the child and uh there's no cover lessons it gets processed completely differently and that's um there's a lot within that that has enabled digital school us to really expand and reach the vast numbers of teachers and students that we have that and the fact that i like to do things differently um you know i always say it was sort of quite known within the the digital school house community you know one of the things that i say quite frequently is no idea is too crazy let's just try it like it might work it might not work but even if it fails disastrously justly we'll have learned something in that process so there's never any harm in trying and that's that's the powerful thing that's really what we need to get across to the kids you know there is no harm in trying just try and failure is not something to be frightened of it is part of the learning process and quite often we amplify you know this you know i can see it amongst my own children this need to get it 100% perfect and correct right from the get go right in step 1 you know when they play a video game the the same desire isn't there they'll retackle the same game level again and again and again until they beat that you know that big baddie um but when it comes to 
you know what our expectations of the work they produce in the classroom is completely different and that that the, the, the two worlds don't meet they're, they're not in sync so a lot of what we do is what i do is well how can we tap into pupils um innate power to play you know he, playing is is part of who we are as human beings we all play from birth upwards you know that's how we learn about the world around us and we never stop learning through play we just stop teaching through play uh, and you know we will continue to learn through play and we you know play evolves so you know in our workshops it might start with magic tricks it might start with um play-doh dancing a game of ludo you know it will it will start with all sorts of different things and i can teach you using playground games i can teach you programming and games design just through a playground game be it hopscotch or or whatever it is and so it's that's the key because then what that enables you to do is really separate um the teaching of concepts to the teaching of terminology historically and I'm, I'm you know sort of saying this from my own teaching i've done this before i've started lessons with all right kids today we're going to learn about ip addressing and what that means in relation to packet switch networks it's like that you know to be honest before i even finish that sentence the kids are half asleep yeah it's <laughs> it's not going to excite them you know it doesn't sound exciting to me and i've taught it for years but you know but if we actually say well i you know what i really need them to learn actually is the concept behind those words the words can come afterwards they're just words if you can detach the concepts from those words you can make the teaching so much more exciting we can teach the same thing using games and uh, and I'm, I'm talking about playful games not necessarily digital games i'm talking about you know the playground games that we do and children discover those concepts for themselves and then the power of what the teacher is doing changes because now as a teacher you're then saying right that thing that you've just discovered there in the textbook it's referred to using this terminology or you know in the industry this is what we call it and now we're just giving them labels to scaffold and and to, to be able to describe what they're talking about a lot better the kids have ownership of what they've learned they've just just you know they have that and that increases their self motivation so imagine instead starting a lesson within that same lesson but this time you're saying right kids today we're going to play a game we're going to see if we can pass secret messages throughout the school and see if we can find the most effective way to do that possible now suddenly the kids are excited because everybody loves secret messages but you know it's it's, it's now it's a game and it's something that they can and they're going to learn all the same skills and concepts you know but the second one is well to me anyway far more exciting so um yeah, you know, and that that's really important because you know technology is um, you know as Monica was saying earlier, it's it's constantly sort of shaping and evolving who we are and what we do and the world we do. Historically, in education, it's been it's 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 been quite simple really. We know the type of jobs that the children are going to walk into tomorrow. We know the type of skills they're going to need, and so we teach those. And um, but the truth is, with the growth and boom in technology, we don't know what their what's those job skills are going to look like in 10 years time we don't even know what those jobs are going to be in 10 years time we really anybody who tells you that knows is lying they don't we don't the new jobs are being invented all the time and as an educator when you don't know what jobs are going to be out there when you don't know what skills they entail how you can't continue the same old didactic methods of teaching it's just never going to work so we have to be innovative we have to think outside the box we have to you know prepare our children and teach them to enable them to continue to teach themselves we have to instill a passion for lifelong learning and provide them with the mental thinking skills to enable them to upskill and solve and tackle problems in innovative new ways whenever they arise. And, you know, because the entirety of the world's knowledge is at their fingertips. So we don't need to them to remember facts and figures and dates because they could, you could Google it in a second. So what they do know, need to know though, is how to ask the right questions. And that's where we come in. I absolutely agree with you. And, uh, you know, my first hand experience uh, was Minecraft when my uh, eldest started playing Minecraft. And, you know, first I thought it, it was just a game. But, you know, him being young, very little, uh, and, you know, he started talking about stuff. And I was amazed that he knew, you know, uh, some terminologies and some you know, things. So uh, I completely agree with you, you know, um, gaming, uh, you know, being innovative is so important, you know, if you're talking about the future of work. And yeah, um, you know, uh, 
this is the way i think uh, learning should be so my next question uh, is one that i ask each of you and i'll start with uh, faiza so what have been some of the key challenges each of you faced uh, pre covid and how did the pandemic impact work on the ground Faiza, you're uh, breaking up. So let me go to Monica, and then we can uh, come back to you, Monica. Yeah. Hi. Hey, um, uh, you know the 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 challenges which existed uh, for uh, especially education publisher was um, definitely it was that um, we had to map our products and books and e-learning to the new syllabuses which used to come like right in the fag end or uh, when you were uh, you're almost ready with your products for the next session so uh, those are the few things and then of course uh, there is uh, uh, there are other uh, you know supply chain and other issues the credit issues which are there which are probably there in all the countries we are right now referring to there is a one year credit or uh, 120 180 days to one year credit to to the products which you have to give uh, and plus there's a lot of leg work which is involved which is which involves the marketing going to the teachers and doing teacher training workshops student workshops and then uh, your product gets selected and after that you have to wait for quite much time for your for your monies to come in and um, they are uh, plagiarism is one thing which has really hit us badly always and also duplicacy which uh, where we we are uh, ref, uh, we are uh, actually uh, you know uh, asking government to make some stringent laws so that those can be curbed to a certain extent but yes pandemic has changed the scenario completely books were totally out of the picture whereby the uh, the books which were already supplied also came back to us which was we are we are sitting with huge stocks of the books and uh, but we also thought that this is the time when students are not going to schools then they are not reading and they are not learning the teachers are somewhere not present at at, at some places even online teaching is not happening then why they are going to avail of books nobody is going to spend on that but to maintain continuity uh i'll be very happy to share that most of the publishers towards uh, you know are, are are part of uh, the world i'm talking about they had given their resources online resources the digital resources free of cost to most of the schools so that at least a learning gap is reduced uh but as faiza said that learning divide is there and uh, uh well she threw a very light on a very important point with the girl and the boy divide which probably is a new thing which 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 i'm thinking on but yes there is a digital divide in india in terms of who has the connectivity and who does not have the connectivity who has the device and who does not have the device so as i said government as is working on aggressively towards it but uh not only the private sector but the government sector also helped us out a lot in terms of uh, the children a lot by bringing their uh, in their reach the so that the content reaches them through whether it's, it's, it's tv channels whether it is podcast through radio or there are some dth channels even specially for differently abled uh, students so government was trying to do as much to reach the children so it was the private sector and so we did, we also did we did workshops of teachers as chanela said that teachers also need to know technology if they are using the technology they don't uh, uh, and it students are far ahead in terms of that learning of technology than children than teachers we did free workshops for the teachers so that they can use these this technology to give their online lectures to take attendance to do whatever they to give assignments to uh, to check assignments and to give report cards so we did that alongside we give them the give them the free content uh, so that uh this is what we could do as publishers for the fraternity at that given point of time from our side so and in case i talk about work workforce also like we are talking end to end connected in the office our each process of book making or or uh, e learning and m learning is in house so practically we never experience something which is work from home 
so again technology came to our rescue at workplace also that these all these people are connected through technology and we are able to deliver the products which which post pandemic we want and during pandemic what we want so uh, i think if that wasn't there we would have been in a much uh, difficult situation because uh, even the 30 40% children who could read wouldn't have been able to uh, avail of any kind of education so our problem would have multiplied further in case technology wasn't there so and uh, i think uh, i i hope that you know the the proliferation of internet becomes uh, uh, is is fast enough especially so the internet rates are the least india has in the effect if, if i compare to the entire world so that is one thing which is conducive giving them the devices is the next step so if we cover that gap as i said in the previous question i think we'll be far far ahead and um uh, is just that india is at the juncture of getting new syllabuses also so that becomes another issue with us because we have we're sitting with huge stock which may not be sellable in hence in one or two years and in one year i cannot sell two year stocks because we had pandemic in fact for two years and uh, we didn't sell much products so this is a problem of each publisher that if of course new nep has come but new ncf has to come and the new saliva has to come if it comes early we were waiting for it desperately all these years but if it comes early now it'll be a problem for us because we all sitting with huge stocks and many many of them will break in terms of handling all that because that's that becomes redundant so um uh what all in all i think that we have challenges now which is post pandemic also where we have to see how do we liquidate our stocks we have to see how we align the blended learning which is the e learning m learning and to your books we need to have newer books even if you try to sell the same this books of same syllabus the consumption pattern has changed in many schools because they want the books to be related to the e learning some schools want that some schools are wanting just uh the assessment and just they just want the books there some schools are wanting digital full fledged app they want so the customization is huge school to school is huge i'm not even talking region to region school to school in in a b c grade or a b c cities it's not divided like that it's school to school is different so customization you require all the more people to be employed with you so that you can customize right now because each school is having a different pain area their experience in pandemic has been different and to how to handle post pandemic is of course hence is different because somewhere they have less children at some places now uh, in government schools these children uh, the, the, the in few states the 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 enrollment has increased because uh, of uh, low cost uh, you know uh, education which can be provided in government schools so the scenario is uh, uh, is in terms very unpredictable we can't predict what we have to produce so that is that that becomes another challenge as a publisher becomes another challenge but if i look at students their challenge is much higher the parents the challenge is much higher they don't even uh, know how to bring children back to the learning they have their their learning uh, curve has fallen down drastically so the parents have to be first motivated at some places at some places the children have and parents both have to be motivated True. for to get back to school especially the rural True. So there are multiple challenges. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Shanila, I'll go to you first, and then uh, loop Pfizer back in. Okay. Um, I think when the pandemic hit, um, I, I think what we literally saw from from my perspective was this rapid upskilling of teachers' digital skills overnight, um, and and actually that that's like a nothing short of miraculous to to a certain extent um I, in in sort of my teaching history i uh, i've always well you always get roped in as sort of the computing teacher and um to upskill and to support uh, fellow teachers within the, your school uh, around uh, improving their digital skills and using using their um technology to enhance the teaching and learning in their, across their own subjects this has been an agenda that's been on the curriculum for well literally decades um and it's there's always been a significant cohort of teachers that have been reluctant to um invest the time in the take up for for lots of different reasons and I, i'm i'm not judging there's lots of different reasons there's the lack of seeing it as a priority there's you know the a million and one things else that are on their plates so when are they going to find the time you know there there's a, a, a huge number of reasons and i um but when the pandemic hit and suddenly 
kids are at home, but the teachers still have to teach the kids. Well, it's like you have to use you have to use Zoom or Teams or Google Meet or whatever it, platform it is that your your school has, and you've got to figure out how to do it. There's no two ways about it because if you don't, the inspection body, well, when they come in and ask questions and say, "How did your kids get on?" You're going to have to answer how you managed to get around that. So there's there's no justification for not using that technology, and um, and and for some teachers, it literally was you know they they needed training on. Um, you know, things like you know, how to share your screen on Zoom, for example, you know, some very, you know, and so there was an element where almost you're going two steps back in terms of pedagogy because people are, are just doing, well, actually, there's, this is a direct, I'm going to talk, you're going to listen and make notes, and then I'll collect those answers in the, you know, uh, later on. And, and, that's what happened in the first one, but at least there was something being done. And then later in the second and third lockdowns, we started to see people getting a little bit more creative in their use of the technology. And, you know, we've, um, we released some videos for uh, teachers, for example, showing how you can do things like play games of kind of guess who and wink murder um, in Google and Teams using simple the ability to turn your camera on and off uh, as a way to engage children so that these lessons they were receiving online were interactive rather than them just listening. Um, but what what's happened as a result of all of that is a massive almost overnight, I believe, shift in perception amongst the professional teaching body in that there is nobody, you will find almost nobody that is willing to hold a debate to say, actually, that I don't have time to use technology to enhance my subject teaching. Like that argument, I almost feel like the pandemic helped us kind of win that argument. So now we're on the other side of it. And now we're saying, well, okay, so we agree and accept that technology can be used to enhance and, you know, and support the delivery of our subject. Now let's figure out how to do that in a way that really does enhance it and really does add flavor. You know, I, I'm, I'm not one for, I love technology and I love books. You know, I'm not one for using tech just for tech's sake. I think that's pointless. Like literally, there's there's no point. There's no point to just using technology for tech. There's got to be a purpose, even if that purpose is just to instill motivation and excitement. That's a, that's a solid reason and a purpose. But there's got to be a, right, a reason for it. You know, and if because if you don't, the children will see through that. That's the thing. They'll see through it, and they won't respect you for that. They they won't like that decision. You know, they'll they 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 then they then resist. So. I think we're in a really interesting wave now. Um, and the last thing, of course, is um, just, you know, before I sort of close off my answer is to say the other side also became even more apparent, the increasing support that needs to be given to parents because parents had a new role to play. Parents became teachers and uh, parents were, were sort of teachers as well as doing their day jobs, as well as doing their, you know, everything else that's on their plate. And especially, you know, working mothers where you got, you first you had to battle work and home and now you're battling work and home and teaching um and and it's insane it's a nightmare it's like how do you get through so i think um it's it's shine a spotlight on the amount of support that parents need and things that we can do as opportunity providers in how we can best support parents um and 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 really sort of make that make that easier with them whether it's you know simple play with your kid and learn this at the same time type of video that, that we were putting out or whether it was something else in terms of books and, and support another, but yeah. Absolutely. Pfizer, uh, over to you. The same question uh, and you're on the mute. Pfizer. Um, Okay. Uh, there's some. Yeah. So, um, in 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 the case of uh, the work that I've been doing um, at Code Girls, so we had to take part of the boot camp online because of COVID restrictions, and we figured it out that it did not work well. Uh, for for women that we are teaching the reason being that when they are home the work that they are doing online is not being taken seriously so a lot of them were missing classes because uh, infrastructure issues because of family issues 
so um we had to kind of take a pause and regroup and then you know restart the boot camp when uh, when covid restrictions were removed and make sure that everybody is vaccinated and stuff like that but that uh, opened up a new area of uh, you know problems that we understood in terms of uh, women having issues at home when working because a lot of them would prefer to come to the training institute and learn because for them when they are home their kids are there their families are there and they do not get the right head space or the space to kind of sit down and work for a few hours so a lot of them would you know keep on coming back to uh, the venue to use the labs and learn there bring out their devices and to work there so that is another area that we understood um you know uh, that that's a problem a lot of them would come and say that we can't work from home because people keep on coming to us and say chai bana do uh, get me some tea so that keeps on happening again and again and they are unable to concentrate in in the classroom so we we basically uh, restarted on site classes another thing we did is that we um, basically started doing small mentorship activities and a lot of different activities online to keep them engaged and that really helped uh, covid also helped us in finding um, you know remote opportunities for these women so we have placed around 150 of them uh, in the local and international tech ecosystem so that opened up a lot of opportunities for women because our employers are kind of open for uh, hiring women rem- remotely so covid was like the most um, uh productive period for us when it comes to uh getting these women hired on remote positions so you know uh you know we are times but again a silver lining out of that that organizations are open that women can you know work part time on work or work remotely or work free on freelance basis so so yeah these are the things that are happening uh, right now we are seeing a boom in the local tech industry in pakistan so that is also helping in in our work in terms of getting more women uh hired that's uh, that's amazing so my next question is uh and i think with the digital revolution which is now intertwined with the global crises including the pandemic we've begun to realize that the traditional ways of learning is an ill equipped enabler of knowledge growth and therefore empower i ask would you agree that there are logistical as well as procedural policies limitations that the education sector faces especially in the global south and by extension the south asian region this coupled with a huge population of you know not having access to digital tools how do we have overcome these hurdles because at the end of the day education envisions transformation shanila i'll go, go first with you hi um i think i think this is this is such a huge question isn't it and i and i think um i'm not even going to pretend to know the um governmental policies for the kind of global south countries um and 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 to be able to comment on individual uh, sort of things there but they are you know they are logist- yes of course they are logistical and procedural limitations that ac- across across the board and i think um a lot of that is about equal access to technology and i think you know that's faced at that's that's a global issue right so um to be to be honest it's something that actually uk we've dealt with here um because there is a, a fundamental issue of um technology being given uh, enough of a priority it sometimes it's not even about do you have the money to spend on the technology right it's not even that that's not even the question sometimes because you might have the money but you might have other things that you need to spend the money on that are a bigger priority like you've got a reefing uh, leaking roof or you've got you know your main assembly hall windows are cracked or you don't have enough security or whatever whatever it is or you don't have enough teachers so that money that you might have spent on tech is actually going to you know as a head teacher i'm thinking well actually what's more important do i upgrade my 10 year old machines or um even though they take 30 minutes to log on um or actually is it more important that i um fulfill and and get enough maths teachers uh, or that i get enough of this and you know it's got to be the the teachers have got to come first so it's about that priority level and and it's being able to spend that money and there's no easy answer um to that necessarily because you know i think education schools i i visit schools all the time that are always saying they just if they had more money they'd be able to do so much more and 
that is so true with with schools globally and across the global south you know in where you've got the rural schools in the rural locations especially you know just not enough budgets to do everything that they would dream of doing i do think industry has a part to play here um to be honest uh, i think industry is a part to play so industry has a um uh, 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 there's a process in industry where you every three years you will um, recycle. You, you will get rid of your machines. You upgrade the machines in your in your company because you, especially in the tech industry, you, you need the latest tech to create tomorrow's tech. So you always need the best machines, and so you're getting rid of them after every three years. So my thing is, don't pay a recycling company to take it away donate that to a school instead because the machines you're throwing away today will be the best machines that other school down the corner has. Okay, I think the time is up uh, for our session. Um, just, uh, I think, 10 seconds, uh, last words, uh, 10 seconds for each of you, if we can have that, just 10 seconds quickly. Faiza, if you have uh, anything to say. I think um, I think the biggest uh, kind of takeaway for me in every in all the work that I've been doing that we need serious governmental intervention on all the stages. Um, otherwise, smaller players like ourselves, private organizations, NGOs, we can't solve the whole pic whole problem because there is a huge problem, and you need to kind of have someone who can view it holistically and. Uh, you know, do do an intervention intervention to make sure that people have the right infrastructure in place. Uh, in Karachi that we live in, electricity electricity is a big issue, and of course, you know, an organization like mine cannot solve it. This is a problem that that's that's bigger than uh, all of us. So I I think my my um, my thought process is that we need the right level of intervention at each uh, level to make sure that things get solved. Thank you, Monica. Uh last words quick, uh, yeah just quickly i think publishers like us we are giving machines and uh, to the trying to give machines to the students on emi so that they can uh, have easy installments to pay the government is having a swayam prabha tv channel which is for higher and lower education and technical education and our government is also doing podcasts with shiksha vani on um, uh, radio channels and also daisy there is one dta channel for the different able students there's a lot more than this but my last uh, what we in terms of it to sum up i would say that we should we you should give each child equal opportunity to learn to educate be skilled be empowered so that they contribute to the society to the country and the world so technology is must for that chanila i um Every child, regardless of background, standing, gender, ethnicity, whatever you put on it, has the right to an equal opportunity for high quality education. And what that means in today's and tomorrow's world is equal access to technologies that will enable them to develop those skills to survive in tomorrow's world. That has got to be the fundamental priority, not just for businesses, but yes, as far as I said, governments and institutions, NGOs, you know, like ourselves, there is a very limited amount that we can do. Um, so it, it's got to be it's got to be a holy, holistic effort to enable us to allow students to evolve tomorrow. Thank you so much, Faiza, Shanila, Monica, for this amazing discussion. Uh, thank you, Ishi. Uh, this has been a really learning experience for me as well. Uh, and stay tuned for the next session. Thank you. Thank you. You're on the mute. Sorry. Thank you to my wonderful panelists and the wonderful moderator who's handled the session. And such excellent points have come up. Uh, right now, I think uh, this is uh, this should give a lot of uh, you know food for thought for people who work in the education industries in all of South Asia and policymakers as well. I, these are excellent points, and uh, you know, hats off to all of you ladies for doing this kind of work and uh, you know for the ideas that you're putting out there in the world. Uh, thank you for being you. Thank you for the work that you do. And stay tuned. Our next session is going to start in just ten minutes. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you all of you. Thank you.